de cette mobilisation à la grandeur des Amériques, c'est qu'on a eu une mobilisation sociale like water, like other environmental services related to seas. Il y a Maude Barlow. Maude, if you don't mind uh, uh, approaching. Maude. Bonsoir, mes sœurs et mes frères. Je suis très contente d'être ici et de participer à cette assemblée historique. Il y a un an, le gouvernement de Bolivie a fait un appel de notre mouvement. Le sommet de Copenhague est devenu une trahison. Et c'était nécessaire de créer un espace et une vision complètement différente si la terre et la vie vont survivre. Ce fin de semaine, nous assemblons ici d'avancer cet espace et cette vision en préparation du sommet de Durban. Je veux remercier les organisateurs de cet événement. C'est beaucoup, beaucoup de travail, je sais ça. Mais c'est très important de ne pas laisser tomber le travail et la vision de Cochabamba. For those of us who were in Copenhagen for COP 615, uh, there were many, many visions and memories. Um, one was the real brutality of the police, came from all over Europe, picked off in the peaceful march about 800 young people near the end, um, left them sitting on the cold pavement for hours with snarling dogs terrifying them. Um, images, of course, of, of uh, you know, total failure at the end and, and a capitulation to the vision that had taken so many so long to come together for. My big memory, though, however, was the corporate involvement. The moment you stepped off the plane, you saw little elves dressed in Coca-Cola outfits giving you Coca-Cola and welcoming you to, Coach, uh, to Copenhagen. And Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General, had decided he wanted to make Copenhagen sexy, so he hired a marketing firm, and they came up with the term Hopenhagen. So Coke and the other companies were all about Hopenhagen, and everywhere you went, there were billboards and videos of happy children running through happy, clean fields by clean water, brought to you by Coca-Cola. So we started, of course, calling it Copenhagen. And to this day, my memory of leaving was getting really mad at one of the elves and saying, I'm trying not to take this out on you personally, but this, you, are, you know, you are, you are assaulting us as we come and we leave with their little Coca-Cola Happy Cups. Uh, Cancun, uh, COP16, uh, some people feel was an improvement. I'm not among those. I think there were... Um, you know, the, 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 the facade perhaps of some advancement with some other countries um, coming into the process, but what, what was given up and the dream of a, of a binding uh, project um, was there and very real. And I think we have to name Canada's part in it. We said when we were in Cancun that the Harper government held the knife that killed the second part of Kyoto because when this agreement is ended, um, that was to be extended. Uh, and it's very, very clear that, that the agenda of many countries, but again, led by Canada, or at least certainly one of the leaders, um, is not to have this um, binding project move forward. Under Stephen Harper, Canada is an echo outlaw, and I am, for one, am, am ashamed. <coughs> Now, the reason that it's not working the way we feel in this room that it should be, and clearly what you heard from Ambassador Solno, is that um, the leaders, business leaders, our business politicians, particularly in the global north, but in some countries of the global south, have wrapped themselves in the mantle of the green economy and green jobs. And their argument is you can just switch bad technology for good technology and everything will be okay. And, and Pablo spoke to some of those um, here. And therefore, we don't have to challenge anything real. We don't have to challenge unregulated trade. We don't have to challenge unlimited growth. Uh, we don't have to challenge the market-based capitalist system that we have. We just have to take advantage of um, going green and making money that way. I would warn us around a new trade agreement called the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, CETA, which is 
in my opinion, and this is some, something from somebody who's fought trade for many years, this is the most dangerous trade agreement Canada has ever negotiated because it is going to open up all subnational procurement and all ability at all provincial, municipal, school, university, water system level, whatever, the right for European and eventually American under NAFTA rules. You can't open it up to one sector or one new set of countries without giving the same treatment to um, your NAFTA partners. So these sub companies, these service companies are going to have the right to challenge every single regulation um, and value that we place um, uh, through our elected officials, through the way we use our spending and so on. Uh, but they're also going, they're also really after minerals, um, ex, uh, energy exploration, um, forests, fisheries is very much an opening up of, of particularly Canada's north um, to the kind of resource exploitation that um, we're all fighting but I think is going to explode. And I would uh, invite you to um, become involved in this, in this struggle. Uh, and of course, as Pablo said, they're putting force fo uh, forward false solutions, carbon markets. They're now into water markets. The whole argument is, well, you'll trade to more efficient use of the water, and therefore it's fine. We have two provinces in Canada moving to water markets, uh, um, Alberta openly and British Columbia quietly, but they're both moving in that area. And the most dangerous of them all, in my opinion, which is something called PES, and that's Payment for Ecological Services or Payment for Environmental Services. The two are used interchangeably. The United Nations now has a whole group actually looking at how you put a dollar figure on nature, all nature, and moving toward a system of so-called conserving nature by turning all of it into a market system. And as Pablo said, this is an extraordinarily dangerous trend um, and one in which we're going to ha see ma nature having to compete with other market forces in order to survive. The spirit of Cochabamba, where I think um, the organizers expected something like seven or 8,000 of us, this happened this time last year, and I think something like 37,000 of us descended on Cochabamba. Um, is a very different model, obviously. It rejects the commodification of nature and promotes debt re the, the repayment of climate debt, um, local sustainable food production, and uh, support for local um, struggles around the world for food, water, energy, um, and resource sovereignty. And just to tell you, in our country, we're organizing an e-teach-in called System Change Not Climate Change Project, which is going to be launched in the fall, which will be electronic and also real on the ground. So it will be um, a project that we can uh, take, where we can take people who are doing this kind of work around the world, put, the, put them all in one package for people to use in their communities. And you want to know more about this, um, ask Andrea, and I'm looking for you, Andrea right back here, who'd be happy to talk to you about it. I just want to spend a minute talking about, again, what Pablo raised, and that is the, one, the other thing that came out of uh, Cochabamba, because of course there was our alternative declaration to Copenhagen, but also what came out of it was a universal declaration on the rights of Mother Earth, and we're very excited. We've got just hot off the press our new book called The Rights of Nature, The Case for a Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. And we will be launching this at the United Nations and publicly this coming week in uh, honor of Mother Earth Day. And I don't know if you know, but uh, last year, Earth Day at the United Nations was changed to, uh, oh, sorry, two years ago, was changed to be called Mother Earth Day by Miguel Descado Brockman, who is, was the 63rd president of the General Assembly. Um, and who I thought they'd get great fight over that, but um, did not. And basically what this project is talking about is how we create a, a global biological commons protected by a public trust everywhere um, in the world. And I just want to quote to you from one of the leaders of our movement. His name is Cormac Cullinan, and he's written a wonderful book called Wild Law. And he wrote the first draft of the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, and he said, the day will come when the failure of our laws to recognize the right of a river to flow, to prohibit acts that destabilize the Earth's climate, or to impose a duty to respect the intrinsic value and right to exist of all life, will be as reprehensible as allowing people to be bought and sold. 
We will only flourish by changing these systems and claiming our identity, as well as assuming our responsibilities as members of the Earth community. I want to say a special word here of thank you to Bolivia, to President Morales, to Ambassador Solon, to um, Ambassador Solon's partner, Elizabeth, who is with us right here. Uh, this is a country, uh, I don't know if you know much about it, a landlocked country that's suffering greatly from climate change um, with melting glaciers. A terrible report came out today about the coming drought in La Paz and, and surrounding areas. Um, Pablo Solon decided he didn't want to wait for another 10 years of uh, discussion around the right to water and just presented to the United Nations General Assembly this past June a resolution recognizing the right to uh, water and sanitation and upset a great number of people including our government and the US government and the UK government and so on. Um, but he stuck to, stuck, stuck to his guns. They, everybody said change the language and soften it and take out sanitation and put in access to because of course if you uh, provide the access it could be a big private company that's um, that's providing the water and then you've done your job. And he said, no, I'd rather lose a good resolution than win a bad one. I'm not compromising. Let's see who says yes or no. And I will never forget standing in the General Assembly the day that they voted on July 28th and we thought we would lose and 122 countries voted yes immediately. Um, not one had the courage to vote no even though Canada had led that fight and uh, many, many countries um, just abstained, 20, 41 of them, but nowhere near the number that voted for it. And they, the General Assembly broke out in applause. And then one country after another, including Canada, got up and, and uh, lectured Ambassador Solon for having the nerve to do this. And I'll never forget looking at him. He had a big shit-eating grin on his face. <laughs> and you could see him thinking he didn't say this, but I am going to paraphrase what I think was in his mind was, what part of we won do you guys not understand? It was it was a, a lovely moment. Uh, and right now, uh, Bolivia has just uh, adopted a right to, to, to nature, right, rights of Mother Earth, um, change to their constitution. Um, they in Ecuador are leading the way, um, telling us how this can happen around the world. And it's very important to uh, underline what Ambassador Solon said, that Bolivia is not alone. It appeared alone in Cancun, but this is no longer the case. And that became very clear in Bangkok. So I'm just going to end by thanking you all and, and, um, and urging us to come together to move the spirit of Cochabamba forward um, as we face the very difficult period of time ahead of us. There are those people who are working in environmental justice and those working in human justice. And I think it's terribly important that we take those two silos and put them together. You cannot have human rights if you don't have a healthy earth, if we don't respect the rights of other species and the rights of, of nature itself. And there's no way we can protect the earth if people don't have the most basic access to water and sanitation and um, livelihood and dignity. We simply must put these together and build a new movement based on a new set of values which are articulated very beautifully in this um, declaration of the rights of Mother Earth. I just want to say that I think that every now and then the human race takes a collective step forward as a species and I think this project is the next human step and I would like to see it eventually adopted um, alongside the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights as the leading covenants um, to guide us into a sustainable and just future. Merci.